Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Rick Brown. I'm Deputy Director at AIC, and it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, afternoon session with uh, two excellent speakers ahead of us. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, welcoming Professor Richard uh, Catalano, who is our next keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Catalano is the Bartley Dobb Professor for the Study and Prevention of Violence and the Director of the Social Development Research Group in the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. He is also Adjunct Professor of Education and Sociology. For over 30 years, he has led research and program development to promote positive youth development and to prevent problem behavior. His work has focused on discovering risk and protective factors for positive and problem behavior, designing and evaluating programs to address these factors, and using this knowledge to uh, understand and improve prevention service systems in states and communities. In addition, Dr. Catalano has extensive experience in developing and validating measures of child well-being that have been evaluated uh, internationally. He has published over 300 uh, articles and book chapters. His work has been recognized by practitioners, criminologists, and prevention scientists and social workers. And uh, today, uh, Dr. Catalano will be presenting on using prevention science to create collective impact in communities, communities that care. Can we please welcome uh, Richard Catalano? Well, thanks for that nice introduction, uh, and thanks to the conference organizers for uh, asking me here. Uh, I really feel honored uh, to be here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Diane Kerr for welcoming all of us to her land, uh, and also the minister, O'Donohue, for his remarks on the critical nature of building capacity of communities uh, to uh, engage in crime prevention and hopefully to get collective impact. Uh, across the community. Um, as Adam uh, Thomason said earlier today, it takes multiple agencies, community groups, uh, residents to really prevent crime. And I think Karen really drove that point home this morning in the, in the uh, first keynote. Um, <coughs> it is great to see that there are such, I've looked at the, the list of uh, attendees uh, I see old friends and new friends uh, in the audience, and I really was impressed by the different agencies uh, that are represented here and the different organizations that are represented here. Uh, it's, I hope that you are chatting with each other at the break and not just with your own friends or those in your own departments, uh, because these collaborations and connections that are across sector uh, are really necessary to harness the environment, to support youth development, and prevent multiple problems, including crime and violence, uh, gangs, uh, mental health problems, uh, substance abuse, all the issues that we've heard about uh, today, as well as things like school dropout uh, and teen pregnancy. So I'm a, a professor, as Rick said, of the, uh, and I'm also the director of the Social Development Research Group. And over the last, it's almost, I think that this year it might tick over to 35 years, and so it's really, uh, it's an honor to be so old, and I wish my cane was with me today. Uh, <coughs> when I first started in this business, I had hair, it was all one color. Uh, my wife says, your hair is one color still, Rick. <laughs> it's just a different color than when it started. Um, but along with the director, David Hawkins, of the Social Development Research Group, and our associate director, Kevin Haggerty, and other colleagues, we've been investigating a couple of different kinds of research. The first thing we've tried to understand is, what are the predictors of youth development, of positive youth development, things like academic success, getting along well with mates, uh, strong relationships in the community, et cetera. What are the predictors of those things eventually happening? And then, what are the predictors of things that get in the way of academic uh, success and healthy development? Things that impede kids from getting there. Things like substance abuse and early school leaving, crime and violence, uh, risky sexual behavior, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, risky driving. What, get, what can we do to understand what the predictors of those problems are as well? 
Now, many academics are really happy at that point. They say, oh, look what we found out. We found out here are the predictors of, of, of positive development. Here are the predictors of negative development. Now we'll leave it to everybody in this room to figure out what to do about it. Um, we've, we think that you are all creating interesting solutions. I, saw, I looked at the program. I sat in in a few sessions. Uh, but I think at SDRG, we're also interested in taking that work a step further to try to say if these are the predictors of later positive or negative outcomes, can we change those factors earlier in development? And what would happen if we did? What would happen if we uh, could uh, take a disadvantaged community and try to organize it? What would happen if that occurred? What would happen if we tried to change kids' commitment to school? Many kids uh, in schools are, aren't, uh, don't like school. It's a place of failure for them often. They get picked on by their mates. It's not a place. What if we change that uh, commitment to school to be a strong bond and a strong commitment to school? Could we do that, first of all, and then what would happen? So we've then developed and tested a variety of uh, uh, family-based, school-based, uh, and uh, community-based uh, programs. So I have three objectives today. Why should we care about prevention? Why is it important to think about prevention before problems occur? What are the key frameworks guiding preventive efforts? And uh, how does, <coughs> I have these initials here, communities that care uh, achieve collective impact? And uh, I'll be talking to you about uh, all three of these things uh, today. First of all, why should we care about prevention? Do uh, to our strong investment uh, in uh, infectious disease prevention, our investment in child health uh, globally. There's really been a sh change, a shift in uh, the global causes of mortality from infectious diseases to uh, non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> and in fact, more kids are surviving into adolescence and young adulthood. What we found is that behavioral health problems are really implicated in this shift to non-communicable diseases. Things like cancers and coming from uh, smoking or uh, heart disease, coronary disease, coming from a, uh, a lack of exercise or sedentary lifestyles or diets high in fat. These are the big uh, killers. And what we see in uh, adolescence is these problem behaviors are the big drivers. Just to illustrate that point, uh, this is data from uh, a professor at uh, the University of Melbourne, George Patton, uh, who published in The Lancet about uh, five years ago the 10 leading causes of death uh, from te uh, for 10 to 24-year-olds across the world. Um, and I just, I, you can read all those things, but here's the point. About 70% for males are due to behavior problems uh, ca caused by road traffic accidents and risky driving violence self-inflicted injuries, uh, often uh, coming from a behavioral health or mental health problem. Uh, many of the drownings are related to drug and alcohol use, uh, and HIV-AIDS risky sexual behavior gets you uh, those kinds of uh, outcomes for males. It's about 57%, almost 60% of all the female deaths in the world are related, again, to these kinds of behavioral uh, health problems, self-inflicted injuries, HIV, road traffic accidents, and uh, early uh, pregnancy maternal uh, hemorrhage uh, and uh, abortions that are causing these uh, deaths. It's also the same in the US. Now, that was globally. I'm sorry I didn't do it for Australia, but I'm sure that uh, if you look in that article, you'll see a very similar thing. But in the US, uh, 10, 15 to 24-year-olds, it's the same picture. About 72% of all deaths are due to these things that are behavior, pro behavior problem-oriented that are really largely preventable. Motor vehicle crashes, accidents, intentional self-harm, pregnancy, uh, childbirths, uh, et cetera. The other thing uh, that was mentioned this morning was about uh, what about high-risk uh, populations? What about Glasgow uh, uh, that uh, Karen uh, was talking about uh, this morning? And uh, just to show you a little bit uh, about our own indigenous uh, populations. So here we are. Uh, this is uh, American Indian, our indigenous populations, or Alaska Natives. 
and it's even higher here. So it's not just 70% as you saw before, but it, this rises up to 82% uh, of deaths that are caused uh, by these uh, behavioral problems. And you'll see on this list, drug-related overdose and alcohol-related overdose join the other uh, usual suspects of uh, mortality. So still just as the end of the first point, prevention is critical for health and well-being. Behavior problems uh, cause harm in adolescence. You saw the mortality that's related to. But, you know, behavior problems that are established in adolescence also create problems into young adulthood. For instance, we know about smoking. About 80% of adult smokers start in adolescence. So if we could kind of nip that in the bud early on, we might be able to prevent uh, uh, mortality and morbidity due to smoking and other kinds of uh, uh, health and behavior problems. And preventing these problems during adolescence may really uh, affect uh, mortality and morbidity across uh, the life course. So if they are largely preventable, how do we do such a thing? And I'm going to try to update you on how I think that states, communities, and schools can help uh, reduce uh, these uh, problems uh, in, in uh, their adolescent populations. And for over 35 years, we've been trying to really understand this. And I think that the good news is that from the, that the work that we've done, not just in the states, but all over the world on looking at prevention and prevention science, we've really made uh, a, bit, a, a big inroad. We know a lot uh, about what the predictors are, risk and protective factors. As we've known more about what those risk and protective factors are, people have said, oh, I know, let's ha hang on to these and try to change them earlier in development and see what happens. There's been a lot of randomized and quasi-experimental trials done over the years. So we know a lot about what works. And so the challenge for the 21st century, as opposed to last century, which was figuring out can we prevent things and, and would it make a difference, is how can we, uh, as government officials and community agencies and community uh, residents, ensure that we're picking the best uh, and the most effective programs to meet the needs of children and youth in our communities. So how do you uh, approach prevention, or how do I approach? What are different approaches? If you look at this spectrum here, uh, this is a, a set of uh, different ways we could intervene from both promotion and prevention to treatment and maintenance. Uh, sort of aftercare is how I look at maintenance. Uh, I started out my research and program development career working at the, at the back end, working with kids uh, at juvenile correctional agencies, working uh, with adults in residential drug treatment programs, and I often was working not just in the treatment area but also in the aftercare area. A lot of kids made Oh, big improvements while they were uh, in institutions, but then they came back to the same criminogenic environment that they came from, and the results kind of uh, fell away by the wayside. So I kept thinking, isn't there something we could do before all these problems occurred in the first place, before kids started having trouble at school, before they had troubles with their mates, before they were in serious conflict with their families? Uh, couldn't we do something before that? And so I often felt like the ambulance driver at the bottom of a cliff underneath a sharp curve, picking the kids up, patching them up. I know I could make a difference in their lives, but it seemed like I should take a step back and do habilitation rather than rehabilitation. So I kept thinking, wasn't there something we could do in that setting so that we could, uh, if there is a sharp, you know, a sh sharp curve and a sharp and a cliff right there, couldn't we put up guardrails around that cliff, that road, so the kids wouldn't careen off the side? Couldn't we even take a step further back and uh, put up signs that said "Danger"? Oops, that's too far away. Step back a little too far. <laughs> Danger, sharp curve ahead. Please slow down. Couldn't we? even take a further step back and do education and, and driver education and give kids enough practice in the car so that they would know that, uh, you know, how to drive and what dangerous conditions may be. And even better, maybe we could put laws in place like graduated driver's licensing. I know that you all have pioneered here uh, where kids would get enough experience before they got their license. 
Uh, they, wouldn't, uh, they would be restricted from driving at night or driving with peers. And best, couldn't we do all those things? Target hardening, you know, the, the guardrails, education, uh, you know, signs, you know, so public health campaigns, education for the kids themselves to how to drive better, as well as laws and policies in place. So I kept thinking, this seems like the right way to go, and I think that many of us are excited about prevention and finding an effective approach to prevention. However, it's not as easy as it sounds. For, so for instance, we know that Ben Franklin uh, was the guy who first got uh, credited for writing down the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, easily translatable in this context is 100 grams of prevention is worth a kilo of cure. Uh, but I think uh, if prevention is gonna go from an old adage, which seems so simple to do, to a science, it's gonna need a couple of things. The first thing it's gonna need is a knowledge base. Uh, <coughs> sorry, is a framework. You need a framework for prevention. And this framework is, comes from public health, so as Karen was saying earlier, violence is a public health problem. All these youth problems are public health problems. We have to think of them as public health problems if we're going to prevent them. And the public health model, the prevention science framework says, what's the problem to begin with? What are we working on? If you're working on cardiovascular disease, that's one thing. If you're working on violence, it's something different. Identify the predictors, those things that increase the likelihood of the problem. Uh, like a, a ri it would be a risk factor. So for instance, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease is what? Somebody tell me one risk factor. Smoking, okay, another one. Part animal fat, okay, how about a protective factor? Exercise, okay, so you get it. We need to do the same thing for violence, for depression and anxiety, for risky sex, uh, risky driving, et cetera. And if we can identify those things, we can then put interventions in place that reduce risk, enhance protection, and make sure we develop, do our program development well enough that, uh, and implement it well. Don't ever evaluate it before it's running smoothly, but then evaluate it and see if it works. So science-guided prevention suggests that prevention intervention should target risk and protective factors for multiple problems. If you do these risk, if you address risk and protective factors for multiple problems, as you'll see, uh, we can actually have multiple uh, positive uh, impacts on many different problems. And I'll show you an example or two before I'm done. So over the last 40 years, we've gotten a strong knowledge base around risk and protective factors, as well as uh, efficacy trials or trials of programs, as well as policies that have been shown to make a difference to reduce these uh, problems uh, and promote youth development. So just to show you really quick, we've probably written about a dozen uh, articles on what risk and protective factors are over time. This is just a summary. You guys give out slides. Yeah, so you t that would be great. So you don't have to, you know, take, you know, <laughs> this would be very hard to copy this table, I understand. You don't have to be, you know, vigorously going ahead. You'll also be on our website uh, in about a week as well. But what you can, I just want to make a few points here. First of all, every area that a child grows up in can put that kid at risk. We'll also talk about protection, so it's not a one-way street, but things in the community can put kids at risk, for instance, Availability of drugs or firearms or weapons. Uh, put kids at risk for substance abuse and violence uh, or delinquency uh, and violence in the, in the way of firearms. There's community laws and norms about these things. We just had such a great presentation by Karen in the early keynote when she was talking about the norms around violence and how those actually can be attacked at a public health uh, level. And there's many other things you can see. Extreme poverty is certainly a risk uh, factor for many of these different uh, problems uh, uh, in adolescence. So here's the problems, here's the risk factors. In, the in addition, there's family factors. I think Karen also, you know, it was great that she was uh, here doing my talk uh, for me this morning in a much more dramatic way. And so it was really great to, to see her uh, say the family is really important. Parents are really important, and there's many risk factors in the family. Again, family is potent across all these different problems, not just violence, 
but you know, mental health problems and school dropout and teen pregnancy. And there's also problems at school or risk factors at school that increase the likelihood of these problems, including not doing so well in school starting at about grades four or five uh, and lack of commitment to school. And then there are things that are in the peer and individual uh, area as well. You know, some kids have a propensity to violence. She, I think she also talked about that propensity being one of the two things that was really critical. Um, but there's also peers and other things. But notice that most of the predictors on this page are about the environment, not necessarily about the individual. Okay. <coughs> In addition to uh, risk factors, there's, uh, I think, some of the most exciting work that's been done in the last uh, 20 to 30 years has been on the discovery of uh, protective factors. These factors were discovered by researchers who looked at kids living in high-risk environments with multiple risk factors. They might be uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods. They might, uh, they might not be doing well in school. And they still noticed that a lot of the kids in those areas still made it. Why was that? Why was it the case that those kids living in those neighborhoods might have done well? And they found a variety of things, both in the individual themselves as well as in the environment. And the individual characteristics were things like, you know, uh, high intelligence, also a resilient temperament, the ability to bounce back from adversity, and a variety of competencies and skills. Uh, in addition, uh, there are things in the environment, uh, and each part of the environment, family, school, peer group, or organization, are there opportunities for kids to get involved in positive things? So if you were at the uh, Smith Street Dreaming presentation, you know, that, was, that community was trying to create new pro-social opportunities for kids to be uh, involved in their neighborhood. Is there reinforcement for pro-social involvement, or is it just reinforcement for problem uh, involvement, as we heard uh, earlier uh, in the keynote uh, presentation this morning? What about collective you know, bonding? What about connectedness between people in the community? Another protective factor. When kids are bonded to their family, when they're bonded to their schoolmates, they tend to uh, be less involved in these uh, problem outcomes, even when they live in high-risk neighborhoods. And finally, a set of healthy uh, beliefs and clear standards for behavior, another uh, protective factor. <coughs> These risk and protective factors clump into two different groups. You can see what happens over time. You know, the family is the first uh, uh, area where uh, kids can be exposed to risk and protection. That's joined by school as kids get into school. Peer groups you know, start affecting kids in late primary school and early middle school. And the community itself can affect uh, kids uh, later in life in some communities, earlier in life than others. But we find that there's two different patterns of risk. This kind of early accumulation of risk, you guys don't have too many snowballs in Melbourne, but I bet some, some place, if you're from Tassie, you might get snowballs, or if you go to the the Dandenongs, you might see some snow. Uh, and the idea is that early family adversity makes it harder for kids to do well in school. They start getting uh, rejected by their peers, and they're having mo multiple problems kind of pile up. But there's another uh, <coughs> pattern that John Toombaru and I call uh, the snowstorm pattern which is uh, even kids who don't have these earlier risk factors but are exposed to an, env an environment where there's a lot of norms positive to problem behavior, uh, a, lot of, a lot of drinking perhaps, a lot of crime, uh, and without a lot of protection. So it's the idea is you're outside in a snowstorm without a jacket, you know? Even the healthiest kid is gonna succumb in the, under those conditions. So there's two kinds of patterns. It doesn't, it's great if your kids aren't born with disadvantage, et cetera, but they still could uh, fall into trouble during adolescence, particularly if there's a lot of other problem behavior going around in adolescence. So the second part of the knowledge base is what works. Um, my colleagues and I from around the world uh, illustrated in this uh, issue of the Lancet or this series on adolescent health, uh, looking at uh, the kinds of programs that we found to work. We found over 100 programs that have been tested in 
uh, experimental or quasi-experimental studies. What does that mean? It, what is an efficacious intervention? It means that it has a strong uh, evaluation design. It means that they've shown impact on some behavioral outcome uh, and also not had any negative effects. Nothing like, oh, well, we reduce crime, but we increase substance use. No, we couldn't put it on the list if it did those two things together. Um, intervention specificity, it had to talk about the population focus. It had to talk about what risk and protective factors were identified. And then it actually had to have some way to implement it in real communities by real people. It couldn't just be a research article written and said, oh yeah, here's a great idea, uh, but you know, leave it up to you to try to read between the lines to how to do it. It would have to have training materials, technical assistance, uh, et cetera, and it'd be great if it had some information on cost benefit. So what we found was wide ranging programs in a, that addressed a wide variety of different outcomes up here and a lot of different kinds of programs from early in development like prenatal and infancy programs, uh, um, early childhood education, tra parent training actually throughout childhood and adolescence, uh, other kinds of approaches, after school recreation, mentoring, things that you do in the schools, uh, like uh, how you organize your schools or manage your schools, how, uh, what kinds of curricula you have that might be drug or uh, violence prevention curricula, uh, as well as uh, <coughs> different uh, kinds of uh, community-based uh, interventions as well. Uh, youth development interventions, some policies, uh, community mobilization, uh, and some law enforcement approaches, et cetera, that we heard about again this morning. The problem is, or at least the problem is from my standpoint, beside, be, despite all this progress, so well, let me just ask another question. What did you see on these last two charts? Were you amazed by the checks or the absence of checks? The absence of checks. Okay, so let me just give you a little history about this old man here. When I first started in this business, there was no checks on these, either of these things. There was nothing that worked. We looked at our first venture into this, we looked at, we found 25 programs that had strong enough evaluations to tell if they made a difference. None of them worked. So when an old guy like me says, at the end of my career, that's pretty good. <laughs> on the other hand, it's here, every, all of you are in here, and there's certainly lots of opportunity to take the next step uh, and, and find uh, programs that work in a lot of different areas. If you see obesity, which I don't know how it's affecting you all, it's just it's rampant in the United States, there's very few obesity, effective obesity uh, prevention programs. So for me then it says, hey, we do know some, some things that work, but really what's the installed base in programs and schools and communities, et cetera, mostly it's programs that haven't shown uh, any effect on these outcomes. So our challenge that led us to develop communities that care, now we're kind of moving into that third element of the talk today, is how can we build uh, prevention infrastructure to increase the use of tested effective prevention policies and then done in a way that we could actually expect them to make a difference um, while recognizing that communities are different from one another and really they need to decide locally what to do. You know, all the, again, all the talks earlier today, it's about investment in community, it's about my caring about my community, wanting to make those local decisions and not having those local decisions taken away from you. But how could we as scientists help people make good choices? That led us to develop communities that care. Um, we've, uh, communities that care is a little different from other approaches to collective impact because we look at uh, focusing on uh, common risk and protective factors. We build the capacity of community coalitions to be able to do their own uh, risk and protective and problem assessments uh, so that they can look at local data about their kids. It builds capacity of coalitions uh, to, imp to choose programs that match their priorities uh, and it doesn't prescribe who leads the coalition efforts. We've had these coalition efforts led by the police, we've had them led by schools, we've had them led by mental health agencies, uh, it really depends on who's the spark plug in different uh, communities. 
So we've been a long time developing communities that care. We first started with the idea and concept in 1987. Then we, then we uh, worked with about 25 communities in our, in our own state of Washington State. We moved to our neighboring state uh, in Oregon after that, and then uh, we've really uh, implemented it across the states uh, in many different communities, uh, getting probably up to about 300 communities across the United States. Uh, Pennsylvania, just to let you know, there's a, there's a person on the agenda for tomorrow, Brian Bumbarger. Uh, who is uh, going to talk about the Pennsylvania experience with communities that care, as well as we've done international implementations in the UK and Australia. Bosco Roland talked about uh, the trial they're doing, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the progress with the pioneering communities tomorrow, uh, as well as we've uh, done this in other communities. And I want to say this program was really fully developed not only by us, by, by all the community members that have been working with us over the last uh, 87 or four, 17 years or so. So more than that, oh, 20 years plus. In fact, we didn't have a version that we would thought was good enough for testing until 2002. So we'll talk to you a little bit about that. Community members have improved it. Community members have made uh, Communities That Care, I think, a successful program. So now it's a proven method. It affects underage drinking, tobacco use, delinquent behavior, and violence. Uh, it's been tested in a randomized trial uh, in seven states across the U.S., uh, also independently replicated in the statewide uh, quasi-experimental test in Pennsylvania. Let me tell you a little bit about it, how it works. Um, <coughs> Anytime you uh, move into a community, you've got lots of different actors involved. You've got lots of different perspectives. Again, if you saw the Smith Street Dreaming uh, presentation earlier today, you saw that they had multiple groups that they had to get involved. And they all had different opinions of each other. And how, could they work together? The police and the, the store uh, keepers, the community residents and the members there. How can we all work together? So you really, to do that, there's a process that we take people through in communities that care. It's really to try to figure out how ready are we to move forward. Can we, and how can we make sure that we identify the key individuals and issues in that community? There's uh, training and technical assistance available for each of these steps. The next thing is we try to organize people now that we've done our community intelligence work, if you will, and try to figure out what are the issues in the community and what, what's going on. Uh, we get community uh, folks that have, are interested in moving ahead to try to get two groups of people involved. Key leaders, those who hold access to resources or the keys to resources, key leader. The keys to resources, uh, maybe uh, uh, police and social service, uh, schools, uh, agencies in the community. Uh, as well as uh, those community residents and others that really care about the kids uh, in the community. So we try to get those with resources as well as those who know how to get things done in the community, talk to them about how to get organized and what the idea is behind prevention science and how they might move ahead in the next uh, several years. We then collect data on risk protection and outcomes and construct a community profile from the data. We use a survey that we call the Communities That Care You Survey. That survey has been uh, administered twice in Victoria-wide. I'm looking at John Toombury, twice. Okay, good, I still have that right. Uh, and so we've really, uh, and we've also done some international testing with the International Youth Development Study. That survey works here well uh, in the schools and it gives a good perspective of adolescents uh, and young people's uh, experiences and perspectives. It has reliable and valid measures, uh, and it really allows you to look in a single profile at what are the most elevated risk factors or most depressed protective factors in our community and what are levels of problems. Really important to have local data. Uh, before we had local data, we started, again, we did this for a long time without any data at all. People said, oh, I know what those risk factors are, the, the schools folks say, it's academic failure, that's the most important risk factor. The police said, no, it's antisocial behavior, it's those kids in the street, that's the most important risk factor. 
the family uh, agency said, no, it's family management problems. That's the most, and so they all kind of yelled at each other until somebody won or somebody stayed at the table long enough to win that argument. They said, Rick, you gotta give us data. We can't just be making, we can't have the same people always making the same arguments. Let's look at some local data to make some decisions. So we, uh, at great hesitation, we've developed this survey instrument. Uh, it's been used in a lot of different places. Cheryl Hemphill here has been responsible for looking at its reliability and validity in Australia compared to the United States. Uh, and others have looked at it in different countries. And it also is a great idea because you can do it again and you can see if you've made a difference because you can you know, do the survey again in the same school's population every couple of years and you can see, did it make a difference or not? So why assess local communities? Why is this important? Isn't it just the same problem? Well, you know, these, this picture represents different communities and the different types of communities. And when we did the, this is just data from our trial, we had 12 different communities uh, doing the, the program. And you can see that there, you know, there are some similarities. There are some that, you know, all have low commitment to school, but not every community had that. Only one community said, oh, we have norms favorable to drug use. Different communities have different risk and protective factors that they want to highlight, not that they want to highlight, but that their kids are telling them exist in their communities. So if you're in, if you're in, this, com if you're in this community, <coughs> you might wanna be addressing family conflict, antisocial friends, peer, peer attitudes about uh, drugs and a about antisocial behavior. But if you're in this community, you might not be addressing the same uh, kinds of things. This one is more per poor family management, uh, low commitment to school, uh, and uh, well, they share the antisocial friends. The idea here is you should, you know, just like if you have a cold, there's a certain kind of prescription. If you have a virus, there might be a different kind of prescription. The communities are just the same. We need to assess our communities, figure out what they need, and then put in place programs that address those priorities. So we get communities to do action planning by matching their priorities to effective programs. Just to show you an example of this, here's a risk profile for uh, a particular community. You can see that there are uh, a couple of risk factors that are elevated. I know you can't read it, I can hardly read it myself. This one uh, here is poor family management and this next one is parental attitudes favorable to drug use. These things have to be addressed uh, with family programs. Uh, in this case, uh, you go to the Communities That Care Guide, you look at family management problems, there's a variety of different ways to intervene uh, with tested programs. Uh, I'm just picking parent training here. Go to the guide, look at the different parent training programs, figure out which one might fit in your community, which one might be the best. <coughs> we then, after communities have picked, and then they're doing all the action here, not me, they're picking which programs they want uh, to put in place. They form task forces on each of these different programs so that they can implement them well, get the right implementers trained, sustain the program, making sure that it's uh, implemented well. Uh, and uh, this whole process uh, takes about a year to get to the program implementation phase. So there's a lot of readiness assessment and assessing risk protection and developing a plan. It takes about six to nine months to do that. At about a year, people put programs in place. We expect between two and five years to see a change in risk and protection, and about three to 10 uh, to see a uh, change in uh, positive youth outcomes. And if you remember, again, Karen's thought this morning was, I told them it was a 10-year agenda. It is a 10-year agenda, and those politicians want to hear three months to a year. Well, it really takes this long. On the other hand, with Communities That Care, you can show them what the progress is at each point. And you can say, okay, well, in two years, we expect risk and protection. In one year, we expect that we'll have different programming in place that's decided upon by the community that we all come together to support. So what happens when you do this uh, approach? We, uh, did a te we tested Communities That Care across uh, 24 different towns across uh, seven different states, uh, at least two cares, uh, 
not two, uh, at least two communities in each state, mostly four pairs, uh, two pairs in each state. Um, they were randomly assigned to be in one end of the communities that care condition or control. Uh, we did a five-year implementation phase, three-year follow-up post-intervention because we wanted to see what happened after we withdrew support uh, to see if it, the uh, effects were maintained. And how we evaluated this is we got uh, kids that were all in the fifth grade at each of those communities. We did a population level sample of all fifth grade kids and then we followed them annually over time. This work is not easy. I think you'll hear that theme a lot about community work. Uh, not only do, do you need a lot of collaborators, but you need a lot of funders to do this kind of work. Uh, there you can see, uh, though, that everybody kind of jumped on board from the drug abuse agencies uh, to mental health uh, to alcohol agencies, child health and human development, and even the National Cancer Institute all came together to fund the trial. And in each state that we were in, the, the single state agency that was responsible for substance use or uh, mental health uh, or uh, juvenile justice uh, participated with us. It's very complicated. This is so complicated. Isn't it so professorial? So Ross, you know, is Ross in here? Come over, he'll love this model. He's over here. Oh, you'll love the model, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Said, no, I won't. I don't like models. <laughs> so let me just say it's very simple. You see on the left side is, if we do training and technical assistance, we expect these middle things to change. We expect that they're gonna adopt more science-based approaches. Yeah, we, we see that little article underneath it. Yeah, we found that. They adopted more science-based approaches than uh, the control communities. You think they'll collaborate more? Yep, they do collaborate more. Community support for prevention, we haven't tested that one yet. Community norms did change. Uh, and also the protective factors change, the social uh, skills, opportunities, recognition, and bonding. We think if those system transformation characteristics change, that's what all those things are called, you see the label at the bottom, if those things change, we expect they're gonna get good programs in place, they're gonna reduce risk and enhance protection. I'm pointing to the screen that no one can see. There's another academic exercise. Okay, they'll do more programming, they'll reduce risk, and they'll uh, enhance uh, positive outcomes. That's our idea. We found that uh, communities indeed did put uh, programs in place. In our 12 communities, they put between two and three programs. They started with about two programs per uh, community at the beginning. There's uh, 12 communities, so it's a little over two. Uh, and then kind of built, got a nice level in between 37 uh, and 39 uh, different uh, programs across the 12. So it's about three programs, three programs in place. Uh, and as you can see, they tend to be school-based programs, uh, sometimes uh, selective programs. These school-based programs are universal programs. You can read th them. I hope you can see them up there. Uh, or after-school programs like tutoring uh, that are more for uh, higher risk uh, kids or mentoring programs, big brothers and big sisters, or family-focused programs that are, that are focused on kids in these uh, age ranges and trying to uh, increase the level of uh, family management and monitoring of kids' behaviors. So as I'll show you, we, we did have effects on many uh, different outcomes, uh, substance use outcomes and uh, delinquency and violence. We didn't have to reach everybody. That's another hopeful message. You don't always have to reach everyone. We reached about uh, between 20 and 50% of the people in the, in the towns and communities. 20% usually with parent training. We can't get all parents out. It's hard to get parents to come to training. We use some other kinds of strategies, the take home program, et cetera, but we got about 20% of the entire uh, group of uh, folks. We got about 50% in our school-based programs. Not all schools will open their doors to school-based curriculum, but we got about 50%. With these kinds of levels of penetration, um, we also had high fidelity. They did it the right way, and the, the, we had two tricks to get people to do the program well. The community board was the one who was in charge of fidelity, not us. We didn't really want it. We gave them tools to check and see if people were doing it right. But the community board members, who those who sat on this and moved this whole 
process ahead, would actually sit in on the sessions and say, hey, that's not going so well. You should do this. Uh, you should do that. Do that differently. Uh, and so they actually were the ones who were the, the uh, monitors of uh, how people uh, implemented programs. And they made changes when necessary. In one case, for instance, uh, people were omitting one of the active ingredients in many skill um, social emotional skills training courses, which is, is, is role playing and feedback. Oh, no, that's too hard. We'll just tell them what to do and we won't have them practice the skill. If you don't have them practice the skill, they won't learn the skill and it's a waste of time. So they, the community members said, oh, you got to change the way you're doing it. You're not putting the essential elements in place. Um, we also helped uh, people by uh, having regular phone call and email uh, and once a year in person uh, uh, contact uh, between our staff uh, and them. Again, they were spread out throughout the country. We didn't have enough resources to visit them every, uh, every little bit. Uh, once a year, a lot of phone contact though. And here's what happened as a result of doing Communities That Care over this time. So here's where we started. Uh, doing communities that care, doing the training, uh, and uh, about three years later, this is three years after implementing, remember I said two to five is when you began to see effects, so three years, we found effects on risk factors and delinquency initiation, about 25% reduction in delinquency initiation in grade seven, uh, at grade eight, continuing um, less uh, delinquency but also less uh, uh, alcohol use, less uh, cigarette initiation, and less binge drinking. Um, and then by uh, age, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, now one year after, this is in 10th uh, grade, uh, we stopped uh, supporting uh, program efforts right here uh, in the communities. And that one year later, uh, we found those uh, effects were sustained, reducing targeted risk factors, delinquency, violent alcohol and cigarette use. And then two years after that, we also found uh, reductions. Again, about 25 to 30% reductions in ever initiating uh, these different uh, substances as well as violence and delinquency. So how does it produce better outcomes? We think uh, we've looked at this a little bit and we think that it's the, the training actually increases the buy-in for science-based prevention at the leadership level not necessarily at the community coalition level, but at those who control resources. They're saying, yeah, we'll spend money on this because it's working. These communities are doing things. We want to do it. So training is essential uh, to get this moving ahead uh, as well as getting key leaders uh, on board because we think that's really the mechanism. And we've shown in some, uh, again, pointy-headed uh, analytic stuff that it actually seems to all the all the uh, effect of the intervention has gone through the key leader adoption. So was it worth the benefit, or, or the cost rather, was it worth the benefit? Was, it, was the benefit worth the cost? Um, we've, uh, we work, uh, you guys have run into Steve Ost, anybody run into Steve Ost, AOS, over the, over the years? Well, there's a couple of you. He, I think he was here last year, two years ago? Two years, yeah. Was he at the Sydney conference? Specifically with Steve, okay, so that's, uh, so Steve uh, does a lot of cost benefit. He's probably, he's probably an international treasure. He's certainly a Washington state treasure. He works in our state. He's not in our office. He works in a separate office. He's, he live, he wor lives and works in a legislatively mandated cost benefit uh, spot. And he's been able to look at uh, the difference uh, in, uh, for that, programs make and then monetizes it by looking at lifetime benefit. Um, and uh, this is communities that care analysis. Uh, this is actually done by one of our colleagues in our shop, but it's using the Steve, Steve's method. And you can see that there, the benefits uh, are both to taxpayers and participants, uh, as well as uh, other or indirect kinds of benefits. Um, and you can see that for the cost of $556 per child. That's pretty big when you think in a whole community. Uh, it's a big cost. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the benefits uh, that are reaped uh, from such an uh, investment 
It's about $8 for every dollar invested. And if you do what Steve does, he says, oh, you, you and David Hawkins did this trial, so you guys did it a lot better than anybody else could ever do it in the world, so we'll cut that benefit in half. And then we still are making about $4.25 for every dollar invested. So again, these days, those are pretty good uh, sets of investments. And it was in the criminal justice system and victimization costs. I just want to bring that to your, so it was really the crime and violence that gave us the biggest bang for our buck since this is a crime prevention conference. That's where the guys are right. We're doing other adaptations of uh, communities that care. Uh, I'll be talking about our electronic web-based communities that care system. We use live training for this. It takes nine days of live training. That's very expensive. You've got to get people to sites and everything else. We've just developed uh, an electronic uh, communities that care webinar based version. I'll be talking about that tomorrow afternoon, along with Brian Bumbarger will talk about the Pennsylvania experience and Bosco Rowan will talk about the Victorian experience here uh, in, uh, in this state. Uh, and uh, we're also looking at uh, trying to see if we can change, you know, early years things like reducing child abuse and neglect and improving child well-being. We're doing a couple of sites looking at those uh, early, uh, early years, seeing if CTC will work in, the, in that area. We're trying to say, can we actually hook this into systems as a way of doing business as usual uh, in high poverty urban uh, centers? Uh, and we're doing a test in one, uh, or doing a pilot, I'd say, in, one, in a large city on the East Coast of the United States, and we're also exploring ad adaptations for indigenous populations in the United States. Last slide, almost. I think I have a thank you here, but other than that, um, just reviewing CTC builds capacity to use data to support and sustain impact at scale or collective impact. It builds capacity to provide by providing tools uh, to help prioritize risk protection and outcomes to match those with effective programs builds capacity to ensure fidelity and, uh, and spread so that the entire target population or at least enough of them get exposed to these programs. Uh, it, it does impact uh, programs community-wide and it is cost uh, beneficial even when you reduce its effect by half. Just so you know, Communities That Care uh, Limited exists here. It's a, it's a collaboration between many different uh, uh, universities, the Rotary Club, uh, the Murdoch Ch uh, Children's uh, Research Institute, and the UW. Um, here's all the places that it exists in, uh, in Australia. Many of them concentrate in Victoria because the Victorian office is right up the street. Uh, and if you're interested in getting a hold of uh, people, communities that care Australia, here's their website. And I just have a thank you. I'll leave this on in case people want to see it. Thank you.